Hello. Today we will talk about plants, the second compartment of the soil plant atmosphere continuum. We will try to model and understand how water goes through the roots, through the xylem, into the leaves, and then evaporates into the atmosphere. <clears throat> Before describing the whole thing and the happenings at the leaf level, we will have to have a second lecture <clears throat> that will deal with photosynthesis and stomatal functioning. So we'll leave that to the next lecture. Uh, we'll conclude this lecture instead with some concepts related to plant water stress and osmotic adjustment. So the soil plant atmosphere continuum, we saw already that before. It's uh, basically how water goes from the soil into the plant to the atmosphere, following a path of decreasing plant uh, water potential. So this is Gibbs free energy per unit volume compared to a reference state that decreases going from close to zero in the soil up to very negative values in the atmosphere. And uh, the way the flow of water takes place from the soil into the roots, into the plant, and through the leaves can be modeled quite well through this electrical analogy. So we'll, in this chapter, we'll try to see what form these resistances or their inverse conductances take in a simplified way. Again, let's not forget that our modeling is always a caricature of reality, but describing this flux of liquid water through the plant <clears throat> following this decreasing path of water potential, and then the evaporation at the leaf level, in, and then the diffusion of water vapor through, through the stone. So let's begin with each component. For each compartment inside the plant, we will write a discrete transport equation of this type, where the flux phi, which is a volume of water per unit time per unit area, so it's a length over time, is proportional through a conductance G to the gradient in potential that we have, in water potential, psi j minus psi i, the two compartments that we're considering. <clears throat> so we'll need to be able to provide a parameterization for, for these conductances. And once we put all of these in series, we only then we will be able to get an idea of what the potential are and what the flux is. So it will require, require coupling all of these together before we get the full solution. It will take a few lectures to get to that. So in particular, as we go from the soil to the roots to the, to the leaves, we will find first the flux here proportional to the gradient in water potential between the soil and the root times the conductance, the soil root conductance. This will imply considering the what happens in the unsaturated soil around the roots as it dries, <clears throat> and then the root geometry type and density and so on. The, we then move to, we're now inside the plant. The plant offers a resistance. This is through the xylem, <clears throat> where the flux phi is proportional to the plant resist uh, conductance times the gradients between the water potential in the roots and the lower water potential at the leaf level. The, fl the flow here is still liquid water, and it's in the form of laminar flow inside the xylem vessels. There will also be, we will see, uh, uh, the risk of embolism for plant, which will create uh, air gaps in the xylem, reducing dramatically this uh, GP. We can of course, put the two resistances uh, in series together and write the, the flux as the series of the soil plant root plant uh, conductance <clears throat> times the gradient between the soil water potential and the leaf water potential. This, of course, is equal to the flux of water that exits from the plant into the atmosphere. And this E we will call E the evaporation the transpiration flux in uh, in terms of still length per time, but it will be water vapor, whereas here is liquid uh, liquid water. This is the Van der Honert equation proposed in, in 1948. Uh, Van der Honert was a, a Dutch uh, eco-hydrologist, antelitterum, if we want. The final step from the stomates into outside, from the leaves outside the stomates, into the canopy will uh, imply considering the stomatal conductance. Now, this is the Van der Honert equation equated to the flux here 
of, of vapor, but this will be equal to a, a conductance at the stomatal level times the difference between the specific humidity inside the stomach and the specific humidity just outside the leaves, outside the stomach. So we see that now here we have a gradient <clears throat> in specific humidity. The mechanism here has changed. It's no longer liquid water flowing, but it is uh, uh, diffusion, diffusion of vapor through, through the stomach. So there is a phase change that we'll have to keep uh, in mind. So the plant, plant is complicated. Um, it's lots of interesting anatomy and physiology, which uh, we only review briefly here. Our goal is to provide, uh, as I said, just simple formulas for the flow of water through the plant for now. But of course, there are very interesting books that I rec highly recommend for, for those who want to know more. So let's start from the, from the roots. Uh, water goes from the soil here has to enter into this uh, as a tiny hair of the roots. This is, this is the whole, this is a cross section of the root, so highly magnified. There are two pathways for water to enter the roots. The symplastic pathway that goes and passes directly through the cells, so it has to cross the cell walls. This is a slow pathway. Um, we will, it, it's not very important for us in terms of, it's, it's much slower. The one that is really more important for us is this apoplastic pathway that basically enters and crosses the cortex of the root through and the water always stays in the cell walls. The cell walls provide less resistance, so this is a, a more efficient way to, to transport water. It passes these membranes and it enters these, these blue guys here that are the pipes of the xylem that start at the root and then proceed all the way up through the trunk into their branches and the leaves. The soil root resistance first. So there is a transport of water phi from the soil to the roots through a proportionality constant, which is this conductance, the soil root conductance, and the gradient of water potential between the soil and the roots. Uh, this is the thermodynamic potential, the force that drives the uh, the water, the fl flux of, of matter, in, in this case, wa liquid water. So the, the flow through the soil is unsaturated flow. So it depends on soil texture, type of soil, and so on. And also on how frequently uh, we encounter roots. So root density, root type, and so on. There are lots of different root anatomy. Um, you can read more in the notes and find references to, to, to get in more in depth into this interesting topic. But We'll leave it like that for now. Uh, let's have a look at the units of this formula. It's interesting to see what is the dimension function of this uh, conductance. So we, <clears throat> using Maxwell notation, we indicate in square parentheses this dimension function of G. So in, on this side, we have length over time, as I said, for the flanks. The water potential, we remember, it's typically exp expressed as a pressure because we have a force and length. This is uh, energy <clears throat> and then we have per volume so this is pressure no force over l l l square so when we solve it for the dimension function of the conductance we get a, a length over time divided by pressure and so it's not untypical it's not uncommon to have meters per second per pascal or, or megapascal depending on what units we want to do but it's a kind of a strange unit that is worth keeping in, keeping in mind because of this combination of it and there are different units in the literature so don't get confused it may be just to the fact that the flux is not expressed in uh, uh, volume but per unit area but but maybe in, in mass or or weight or, or moles or, or other things so but, but let's try to see what is the structure of this uh, soil root resistance. So we have seen that there are uh, the pathway that from any point in the soil to get into the xylem, uh, where then we change compartment, let's say, um, the, the water has to cross this unsaturated soil, get into the, this uh, fine hair, these roots, fine roots that, that this is the, again, the cross section of the root, enter here, cross the cortex and get into the xylem. Let's just consider here the, the apoplastic pathway, which is the faster one. But anyhow, there are two. There is the soil root surface part, and then there is from the root surface to the root xylem, 
portion of, of this overall pan. And uh, <clears throat> in reality, when we consider plants do all what they can here to get water into the in, into the xylem. So they try to minimize this resistance. Things are built in a, such a way that water can flow as easily as possible. So typically, especially when the soil is dry, this is the dominating uh, uh, resistance, which means that the, the conductance here is almost infinite. And so we can only worry about this part here. And if we do that, we need to remember what happens in the soil. So go back to the soil chapter and recall the unsaturated hydraulic conductivity, where, the, where we wrote that the flux, which is the discharge over area, remember the generalization that, that, did, that Buckingham did of the Darcy's law for unsaturated soil, is simply proportional to a, an unsaturated hydraulic conductivity, K function of relative soil moisture S, a strongly nonlinear function that depends on soil type, times the gradient, uh, here is just the vertical direction, but it's in the direction of the flux, the, the gradient of the soil water potential. Soil water potential divided by the specific weight, because here the original formula has uh, uh, hydraulic, um, uh, hydraulic head, hydrostatic head. So it makes sense. Now, if you imagine that you have to integrate from this point to here, this is just for an infinitesimal dz. Now they imagine that we go from here to here where more, most of the resistance uh, takes place. It makes sense to assume that our flux from the soil into the xylem, where this part is negligible, is simply Ks, which we have here. Gamma w goes out because we treat it as a constant. And then we can integrate this uh, um, derivative and say that there is a gradient of psi s that we had at the beginning here, a representative psi in the soil versus a representative psi in the root. So this is the gradient driving the flow divided by, and we need to integrate over length. And, and the length really that offers resistance is this one, which we call this L between the soil and the root. It's a typical distance, as we say here, traveled by water from the soil to inside the roots. And so we finally get this formula for the soil root conductance. K, unsaturated hydraulic conductivity, divided by gamma w that comes from having to go from uh, water potential in Pascal's to water potential in, uh, in, in, as a length, as a head, meaning energy per unit weight, divided by this representative resistance. Now, what do we do for this resistance? Well, at least for dimensional reasons, we can write a formula, that the empirical formula of, of this type, where basically we can say that this 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 length depends on how big the roots are so the diameter typical diameter of the roots the bigger the roots the more distance typically between them there is the finer the roots the more dense they are uh, zr which is if you remember from uh, when we vertically average the the soil water balance is the rooting depth so it's the depth of the root horizon or the A horizon, ZR, so that, that increases that, that length, the pathway of water that has to get to the average root, root divided by this RAI, which is the root area index, the ratio of the surface of root area per unit ground area. So it's a dimensionless, dimensionless number that uh, people have tried to estimate, and here it's uh, expressed for different biomes, so we can have uh, boreal forest and tundra around five, uh, temperate forest around 10, and uh, grasslands and savannas much higher root density than 42 in this case, and grassland 79 temperature grassland, the highest uh, values here. So, and this gives you a sense of the rooting depth also that you have uh, for, for this. These are averages where most of the roots are. Um, for, for these biomes. And these this data are taken from Manzoni and et al. in a paper of advances in water resources in, tw in 2013. There are a lot of interesting things that we could say about the roots. Uh, root geometry, root functioning, 
uh, one of the things that is particularly striking that has been observed relatively recently is this hydraulic redistribution. During the night, roots actually uh, take water from deeper layers and move them. In part, it is a passive thing, just driven by gradients in water potential. In part, it's actually an active process by plants. And uh, where we're at night, they replenish here, they, they water, they wet this part of the soil where there are more nutrients. So the next day, they can uptake when the uh, transpiration stream starts again, they can uptake um, also these nutrients into, into, the, uh, into the plant. Now, this creates all sorts of um, dynamics because this water becomes available also for soil microbes, for other plants and so on. I'm not going to say much more about this, but uh, invite you to read more uh, about the hydraulic distribution or the hydraulic lift, as it is called also. In, in the notes. There are also other things, uh, other references about root um, archi architecture and so on. Let's move from the roots to the xylem. <clears throat> xylem is very interesting. This is the trunk of the plant, but also grasses have the same, uh, all the vascular plant have the same structure. And basically there are all these uh, conduits, these vertical pipes, flowing, this is a cross section of the, of the trunk, flowing from the roots to the branches, into the leaves. And there are two parallel um, networks. One is the phloem, this, uh, um, the one here that is in, uh, uh, I can tell, this is the one in blue, and the one in, in uh, pink here is the, is the xylem. So the xylem is the one that takes the, the soil water to the leaves, and it's a one-way stream. The phloem, it's, it's another uh, network that circulates through the plant. The sugars is the sap that is produced at the leaf level and then gets back to the, to the entire plant to, to provide nutrients and, uh, and sugars. We're, we're not going to talk about the phloem much um, at all, but, uh, but there are some references and some notes in the, in the book if, you, if you're interested. So, so what happens basically in the xylem is that the water comes and has to flow through these pipes of very regular shape, we will see, and has to pass through uh, plates and other things that provide both structure and also protection against, against embolism. And so these vessels are typical of hardwood, for, uh, hardwood trees. If you are dealing with a conifer, typically we are not talking about these vessels, but they're called tracades. And, and they're more elongated, they're, um, there's, they, they have a different architecture, so they, they also have different hydraulic properties. But <clears throat> what is important for us is that the flow through, through this complex network of pipe can be represented quite well, again, as a discrete transport uh, formula. So we have the same flux that, of water per unit ground area that went through the soil through the roots, now gets into through the xylem proportionally to a plant conductance and the gradient between the roots and the leaves that span the whole xylem. Now this is the type of networks that we see. This is a picture. We have here 100 microns, so not, not very big pipes here, of irregular shapes, and uh, sometimes interrupted by this type of uh, uh, membranes, so additional concentrated resistances as we go. The flow inside these pipes is, the pipes are so small and the velocities are so low that the flow is of laminar type, it's viscous laminar flow, uh, which produces uh, viscous dissipation. And uh, due to the, as, as it goes, the free energy, which is basically the hydrostatic head that drives this, uh, um, it drives this flow, these this vessels here are under suction, so it's, it's actually everything is under tension, it's suction here, but, but there is going to be viscous dissipation here. And uh, if this suction gets too high as the uh, soil water potential and all the plant water potential goes down during droughts, there could actually be so much suction that air through these little pits that you can probably see here can enter from the outside and uh, produce embolism. Now, if you get this embolism, the plant 
a conductance drops dramatically and uh, the way to describe it we will see is through the so-called vulnerability curves. As I said, the flow through the xylem vessel is of laminar type, meaning that the, we have a, a, a flow here in, in a pipe, let's say a circular pipe, as we do typically in fluid mechanics. The flow is very slow, so it, it remains laminar, it doesn't get turbulent. The velocity provides a beautiful parabol paraboloid, and uh, the formula was originally obtained in 1831 and then independently but by Hagen and Poiseuil, 31 Poiseuil, uh, I think 1846 Hagen, and justified theoretically with the, the laws of fluid mechanics by Stokes. Uh, the formula, if you don't remember, go back to and review it in, in, in your fluid mechanic textbook, but it's that the discharge through the pipe is proportional, first of all, to the gradient in, hydro, in hydrostatic head, delta H. Then it's proportional to uh, the, the fourth power of the radius. Gamma W is the specific weight of water. And it's inversely proportional to the length that you're traveling. It's inversely proportional to mu, which is the dynamic viscosity. <clears throat> if it is basically for us, it will be the one of water with a few salts inside. And this number eight here is typical of the circular pipe. If you have pipes of different shape, you will have different uh, numbers here. And our pipes will certainly be not circular, as you've seen in the picture before. So we can expect all sorts of numbers here and, and all sorts of constants. We will talk about that later. But, but this is the general formula that we have. Um, how can we connect this to the transport formula in terms of water potential? Well, that is easy. We just have to remember how to link the hydrostatic head which is energy per unit weight. So delta H, which is delta of the elevation plus P over gamma, which is the pressure head. And now if we multiply these by gamma W, which is the specific weight of water, we get a, a pressure, which is exactly the gradient in water potential that we need. So the gradient in hydrostatic head also basically means that we have the gradient in uh, water potential through our exilent pipe. So the flow phi is the flow rate that we have divided by the area, cross-sectional area of the pipe, 2 pi r square, which gives us, once it's plugged here, this formula for the transport formula. Okay, so length will be the length that we imagine that there is from the roots to, to the leaves, an hypothetical radius. Of course, this is all for idealized conditions of circular geometry that we cannot really apply. But it gives an idea of what are the controlling factors of the, of the so this basically will be our, uh, our conductance, no? This is the gradient in water potential, this is the flux. So it clearly depends on how proportion, uh, proportional to the square, to the size of the, of the conduits, and it will depend inversely proportional to the length that it has to travel, so how tall the plant is, and what is the viscosity? The viscosity, don't forget, depends on even temperature. So as temperature changes from summer to winter, the flow will be the flow will be different, provided that there is transpiration. So for at least evergreens. <clears throat> so just to get an idea of the typical number numbers involved, the bulk velocity inside the xylem vessels, vessels can be estimated around, has been measured with sap flow measurements around one millimeter per second, so very, very slow. Uh, the typical diameter we have seen are very small, so 0 0.04 millimeter is a good number. Once we plug this dimension and calculate the Reynolds number, which is the bulk velocity times the diameter divided by the dynamic viscosity, <clears throat> we get a number of 0 0.02, which is extremely low. So this is so-called creeping flow at the low end of, of the laminar flow, uh, where there are no dynamic component at all. It's just a very, very slow, viscous flow through, the, through these pipes. Now, we have complex pipe geometry, so not circular, not circular pipes. We also have these membranes that provide concentrated losses throughout our pathway. There is just no way we can provide a, a, a 
anything here that would be not empirical. So GP, for, we will treat it as an empirical coefficient. And uh, <clears throat> these are the typical values that people have measured and estimated in different biomes from boreal to, to desert um, for, for different uh, types of, of trees. So conifers, evergreens, deciduous. Remember that they have different types of vessels or tracades or uh, sometimes even non-woody parts. So <clears throat> notice that here is Kp sap. The units are kilograms per meter per second per megapascal, not quite our units of G that we saw before. And this is because this reference considers another convention where basically Kp sap is not GP, but it's, G, it's, it's a GP, it's Kp divided by the density of water times a typical length that it has to travel. So this is Kp is the conductance per unit length referred to the mass of water, basically. But with this formula, you can go back to GP and get a sense of what the numbers are involved. Normally, we have liquid water flow in the, in the xylem vessels during well water conditions. But as droughts proceed, as dry, uh, conditions become drier and drier, the suction, the tension of inside the xylem becomes very strong. The suction becomes uh, such that it can actually suck water, air from outside uh, uh, the, 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 the xylem and produce embolism. So, what happens is that there is formation of bubbles inside the xylem, there's breaking of the water column and big disruption of, of the water flow. So the, if, if you see what happens to the plant conductivity, K or, or GP that you, that you plot here in percentage, as the plant water potential goes down, this is well water condition, and this is increasingly drier condition, the conductance drops and drops pretty regularly. This is branches, and these are roots. Uh, the measurements refer to the Spinus taeda, which is the loblolly pine uh, uh, that, that you have in the southeast of the United States. <clears throat> and you see that this, there is a regular decrease, but quite sudden, and almost zero conductance left at some point. These are called vulnerability curves and are sigmoidal functions that can be easily parameterized for, for our models. But uh, so some, some plants, many species, roots, and, uh, and branches are vulnerable to, to cavitation. But if you look here, the roots are more vulnerable to cavitation. The reduction in conductance takes place much sooner at when the water potential is still relatively higher than branches. And why is so? Well, it makes sense, if you think about it, to have the weakest point built in uh, in the lowest level where it's closer to water, where it can be replenished, and if there is embolism, it can be repaired more easily at the root level than at the leaf level, where you have to send water all the way up to somehow reconstitute your continuum of your water column. So this is a, a, another way to say that basically roots, from a hydraulic point of view, also act as a fuse, um, like you do in your electrical circuits at home. You put uh, the fuses, the thing that are the first thing to break when there is a, a surcharge uh, in, in electricity and um, in voltage so that, that you can easily go and, and uh, first they protect the rest of the, of the electrical plant and, the, and the secondly, it, it, it's in a place that is easily relatively to, to change. No? So the, uh, on top of that, there is also, uh, these curves are very different for different types of plants and biomes. People have noticed um, scientists in this area have noticed that there is a kind of a trade-off between plants that are uh, adapted to humid climates, these uh, uh, mesic plants, that have typically higher conductance. They can afford bigger xylem vessels, uh, but they can be more prone to cavitation because if you have bigger vessels, then you will have thinner walls. Or xeric plants, which are plants that, that live in uh, um, drier conditions where they have much more resistance to cavitation. They have thicker wood walls around the, uh, the xylem vessels, but the, the resistance is, 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 is much higher. The, the conductance is lower to, to water flow. So there is this 
trade-offs, these strategies that plants have, have developed. In fact, we can see them here. These are parameters. Uh, the Psi 50 and A are two parameters, these vulnerability curves, how they change as you go from uh, boreal uh, forest, temperate Mediterranean, tropical drive, according to different types of, of plants. So these are data from the literature. And there is more description on, on these vulnerability curves in the, in the notes. There are also lots of interesting other things that one could uh, talk about, uh, talking about hydraulics and fluid mechanics inside the plant. One is how this embolism takes place, starts the onset of it, and also how then once it's formed, it can be repaired and, and what plants can do and what geometry they have developed and, and biology also to, to avoid it or to keep it uh, under control. So uh, again, I refer to the notes for, for more references and more detail. So let's get, we're done. Now, once we get into the, the xylem ends at the leaf level, this is a cross section of the leaf. Now, water from here in liquid form diffuses somehow into these stomatal cavities. You see these, these openings uh, the, at, the, at the leaf level are stomates. Stomates means mouth. There are little pores in Greek. There are little pores that uh, where water now here evaporates and then diffuses out. Into, into the atmospheric environment in the canop at the canopy level. At the same time, as these pores stay open, these stomachs stay open, CO2 diffuses in, which is the main purpose of the plant, is to uptake CO2 here to do photosynthesis. And we will see that later on in the next chapter. But for, for water, for the purposes of water transport, we get from here, all the way through the mesophyll here, which means in, in the middle of the mesophyll, means in the middle of the leaf. These are the cells in the middle of the leaf. And then this is just open space. These are the stomatal cavities and, this, and then out. So what about stomates? Well, if you take a cross section, well, first, if you look at the picture, they look like these little peas, these pores, I don't know how to, they look like uh, beans or something seen from with the eyes. But these these guys around are guard cells that are the ones that inflate and deflate, open and close the, the stomatal cavity. This is a control that plants have, de have developed to save water when they need and open to wastewater, of course, like like tra transpiration, but but then get CO2. There is no point in plants to get CO2 and keep the stomachs open if, if the leaf is very dry and cannot do photosynthesis. So that's the, this is, this is really a key valve for us uh, in eco-hydrology where the, that we will see controls not only the water flux, as it is clear here, and the CO2 flux, so the whole growth of the plant, but also the energy flux because it changes the partitioning of energy between sensible heat and latent heat. We will see that later on. So it's, it's a crucial step, probably the most important step, um, besides the storage of water in the soil in, in the whole eco-hydrology. It's really where biology meets physics, the abiotic and the biotic component. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the, I've, I've already said that this open is controlled by the guard cell. Uh, the, the way it's done is that uh, it's basically through osmotic adjustment, plants pump ions into these guard cells. They function as osmometers, so they, as you increase the concentration of solute, the osmotic potential goes down, the pressure potential goes up, and they get become turgid, and then they open. They stay inflated and form a nice donut around the, the, uh, the stoma. If they want to close, the solutes are removed, the pressure goes down and then deflate and close the stomates. And that's the way they close. The, the range of a stomatal opening and closure spans the whole range of water stress. So when the stomates are fully open, we can say that we're in well water condition. When they start to close, there is an incipient stress. We can link that to a soil moisture level that we will call S star. 
and or, or to a plant water potential or leaf water potential that we call psi star, all the way to full toma stomatal closure when we are basically uh, not doing anything as a plant and the plant starts wilting. And so this is the extreme water stress that we call wilting point. And we can associate that to, an, to a soil moisture value that we call wilting point or to a plant water potential or leaf water potential that will be the, the wilting water potential. Okay, so this will be extremely important for us also from a modeling point of view to go from S star or Psi star at when the stomates begin to close all the way to the full closure uh, when, when there is full stress. Below that, plants basically don't transpire. In reality, the, okay, when we speak of fully stoma, full stomatal closure, uh, there is not a perfectly uh, sealed surface. There will be still cuticular transpiration, so something that passes through through the cuticle, through the skin of the of the of the leaf. And uh, if the stomates are damaged, uh, they cannot close completely, so there will be some some flux through through that. That we may want to keep it into account. Um, also from modeling point, modeling purposes. So two steps important to remember from once the, the water leaves, the xylem gets into the mesophyll <clears throat> to get outside of the stomach. So the first one from a physics point of view is that it, the diffusion goes here, this is still in liquid form, and then the phase change, the evaporation takes place inside, inside the stomach here instead the, the, the cavity. This is air, and so there is evaporation. And the water, the water vapor then next diffuses from here to outside the leaf, just as a thickened diffusion, molecular motion. There is different concentration, drier here, wetter here. And so there is a net transport from inside to the outside of, of the leaves. Mm -hmm. So one, and we, approx we will approximate that as a one-dimensional thickened diffusion. It's not really a one-dimensional process, there are, of course, two-dimensional components through, through the pore, but this is good enough for us, and, uh, and it will serve as well, and there will be some empirical coefficient adjusting for the potential uh, imprecision that we make. So the last step, then, is to account for the continuity equation uh, of the flux, liquid water, as I said, going through the plant, evaporating at the inside the cavity, the stomatal cavities, and diffusing out into the canopy space, where we call it E. So the formulas now, the continuity is that the liquid flux phi, proportional to the soil root plant resistance times the gradient between the roots and the soil and the leaf, <coughs> sorry, the soil and the leaf potential is equal to the water vapor flux, flux through the st stomates okay which is in turn proportional to the stomatal conductance times the gradient in a specific humidity because now we are transferring uh, uh, vapor so we'll talk about how this takes place uh, through through the leaves and then into the atmosphere as turbulent flow but it's, it's a gradient in in specific humidity so this is the specific humidity <coughs> inside the stomates and this is just outside the leaves. Remember from our review of thermodynamics that specific humidity can also be written in terms of uh, uh, vapor, of uh, uh, partial pressure of water vapor that we indicate as E. And so it's uh, Q is E times 6.0.622 over the atmospheric pressure E. And, and so Q is simply this guy. And Q0 is, is, is E0 times 0.622 over P0. So we will use these two independently, uh, whichever is, is more convenient for us. Okay. Um, we may assume that inside the stomates, as the water evaporates from the mesophyll into the cavity, okay, you see, okay, here, here. Um, we have this this takes place it's a non-equilibrium process everything is in non-equilibrium in reality but it, it happens so slowly in the in, in such a small place <clears throat> that it can consider uh, um, 
taking place in states of thermodynamic equilibrium. So that you can actually take equality between the chemical potential of, at the in the liquid versus the one in the, in the vapor. So, so let's assume that we know the leaf water potential, the water potential of liquid water inside the mesophyll, this uh, psi L. And if we assume thermodynamic equilibrium, we will say the liquid water inside the, the leaf will be equal to the water vapor potential inside the stomatal cavity, psi i of the water vapor. This is the statement of thermodynamic equilibrium. Now we can also say that the, this stomatal cavity, these leaves are so thin and so small that basically we have the same temperature between the mesophyll, the leaf part TL, and the, the TI, which is inside the, the stomate. So let's consider isothermal condition. So if we now want to link these two and understand what is the condition of the water vapor inside the, in the stomatal cavity, given the water potential in the leaf, we don't know even this one because that will be connected to all the other equation of water transport all the way to the soil, which we haven't coupled together and haven't solved. But let's assume we know this one and want to get the EI, which is the uh, partial pressure of water vapor inside the, in, inside the stomatal cavity. So we, we remember from the review of thermodynamics that the water potential of water vapor is RT divided the molar volume of water log of the ratio of the actual pressure, partial pressure versus the saturated pressure, which depends on the temperature of the leaf, mm -hmm. plus, of course, the gravitational component of the water potential. But this is typically negligible compared to this, to this guy here. Yeah. Um, so we can actually solve, now invert this equation, solve it for EI, which I've done here, and express the inside pressure, partial pressure of water vapor. <clears throat> if we divide it by E side, this will be the relative humidity inside the stomatal cavities, which will be the exponential function of something that contains the, the water potential at the leaf level. So the lower this guy is, the less saturated our uh, inside the stomachs are. It, it, it will only when this, when only when the elevation is zero, and when this guy is zero, this guy is one, and then the inside the stomachs is equal, is saturated at the level of, <coughs> of, um, of, of saturated uh, pressure. So we are now, as I told you, ready to go from, there is a, there's been evaporation from the mesophyll to the inside the stomachs, thick and diffusion to just outside the leaves. Now the water vapor has to leave the canopy and go outside of the canopy. The last step will be through to get this final transpiration as the atmospheric conductance of the gradient of specific humidity between Q0, which is just outside the leaves, into QA someplace in the atmosphere, we'll see that the logarithmic layer we'll, we'll talk about later on, and this is proportional to a conductance which is called the atmospheric conductance, with conductance which we'll be discussed, uh, we'll discuss later on in, uh, in two or three lectures. But what about GS? I've not said much about uh, what happens to the stomatal function, how plants open and close their stomach. This really the, the degree of opening of stomata defines the level of uh, re, uh, conductance or resistance that we have to water flow throughout the, the whole business of soil plant atmosphere continuum. Now, to understand how this can be modeled, we'll have to understand photosynthesis and see how plants actually operate to why they need water at the leaf level and why they may choose to close the stomach to save water because they cannot do photosynthesis. So we'll, we'll do that in the next set of slides. For now, let's just close here by um, a final uh, review, a final mention to what happens when plants get under stress. Now you have a sequence, imagine that you just had a, a rain event and then time progresses towards a drought, so a dry down. What happens is that soil moisture gets lower the volumetric con con water content gets lower because of losses by evapotranspiration and percolation. The soil water potential goes down, therefore also the plant water potential goes down. And this 
creates lots of trouble at the cell level, stomates begin to close, the protoplast, the, the inside of the cells begins to, of course, also reduces the plant water potential, which means that the pressure potential tends to become lower, the turgor becomes lower, and so the cells become def deflated and start shrinking. Uh, this has huge effects on physiology. Growth is, is reduced, the cell structure is changed, photosynthesis is impaired because for two reasons. One, because we close the stomachs, and second, because water is needed at the photosynthesis sites. Um, the whole metabolism of nutrients and, and carbohydrates is, is disrupted and gets more and more impaired until then we get first temporal damages and then even permanent damages, and we can actually have a plant wilting and, and dying if, if, it, if the drought continues. What we really have as uh, drought progresses is an increasing sequence of worse and worse conditions. This is a nice uh, compilation um, of, of bad things that happen to a plant as <clears throat> the water potential here is reduced. Re this is reduction in tissue water potential. So this is well watered and this is minus two megapascal, so pretty low values. And at the beginning, plants start re reducing their growth the cell growth um, start reducing also the, the rate at which they synthesize new, new cells, at which they uptake and process uh, nitrogen and other nutrients. But what really, as I told you, happens is that they also begin to close their stomachs and they keep reducing the opening of their stomachs until they're fully closed, only at very extreme values of stress. So as I told you, stomatal closure spans the whole range of, of uh, water stress. But in parallel, you also have CO2 assimilation that gets reduced as the stomach closed. Respiration, so the, oh, since all the plant metabolism is reduced, plants also reduce the respiration and, and the sugar accumulation and other, and other things. So we have a point of onset of stress, as I said, we can uh, single out a, a plant water potential or a soil uh, relative content as a star. The whole behavior of the soil plant atmosphere continuum from a hydraulic point of view and from the water potential point of view is, is nicely summarized by this interesting hydraulic scheme. Um, let, let's go through it step by step together. We have two compartments, the beginning and the end, soil and the atmosphere. And inside here, there is the plant xylem represented by this single pipe going up from, uh, let's say, zero elevation at the soil level up to, let's say, 10 meters here for a 10 meter tall plant. And so you see that the, wa the water in this compartment enters into the roots here, goes through the xylem, flows, arrives at the stomates. The stomates can open and close, so it's like a faucet here, it's like a valve, but there is a bypass representing the uh, cuticular transpiration, the one that cannot be stopped in any case. Um, as the water flows here, liquid and then evaporates and becomes vapor and then into the atmosphere, the water potential drops and is plotted here in this axis in megapascal. You see psi water potential. So you, let's say that we start from a decently watered soil at minus 0.3 megapascal. The water has to go through the roots in, from the soil into the root, so there is a soil root resistance, there is a drop in water potential, and then the water potential keeps uh, dropping because of the resistances to the laminar flow through the xylem pipes, gets into the stomata here, and then <clears throat> drops because of the stomatal uh, resistance. The more the stomates are closed, the more, the more this gap will be. And uh, <coughs> It drops actually to very low level. There is a cut here, which is changing the scale because the atmosphere is typically at very low water potential, as we know. Minus 100 is, is a typical value of relative humidity that are not even too low, 40 to 250 percent. So that is the gradient that we have, and this is the, the, the drop typical in th through the plant. The, if the soil is drier, you start from a lower level here, and you have less of a gradient overall. The drier the atmosphere, the more gradient you have. 
you can also plot these energy grade lines. Now, I should have said that the, we, we are able to plot energy grade lines here because if you consider that uh, water potential is energy, Gibbs free energy, but instead of referring it per unit volume that gives you a pressure, you defer it per unit weight, it gives you length, it gives you head. So these are actually length that you can plot to, to scale. And you can also separate, for example, the components of the water potential. So this is the total water potential. But let's see what at this level, for example, in the plant, you will see that if this is the total and it's very negative, let's say it's minus 0.8 megapascal. Um, a part of this is attributed to the osmotic potential omega. There is not there are not many solutes in the xylem. So typically <clears throat> the osmotic potential in the xylem is on the order of minus. 0.1 megapascal. So we get to here. The rest is the xylem pressure potential or, or metric potential, if you wish. It's it's negative, and it's it's a it's it's because the, the xylem. The more you go, the more tension there is. And so this gives you the idea that you can have cavitation if if these levels drop too much. And <clears throat> up to here, up from this point up is G is the gravitational potential because we have these 10 meters also to, to, to climb up from the roots to from the soul, roots to the uh, to the leaves. The last thing I want to mention is <clears throat> well I should have said that also that the these pipes here are not, nothing but piezometers that I imagined attached to, to the compartments okay one two and three and, and just show the level at which the, the plane of zero pressure gets. So basically, this tells you where the water potential stands from a physical point of view, if you want to visualize it in a hydraulic way. <clears throat> but as I was saying, there is another thing. So this is the, the water flowing from the soil in the apoplastic uh, pathway through the xylem and to the atmosphere. In, through the leaves, but there is water contained in the in the cells, the protoplast of the cell. So this, imagine that this is a cell of the plants, is connected to the rest of, of to the water inside the xylem through an osmotic me membrane, which is not just osmotic but is also elastic. And there is, let's say that there is this pipe that connects them, and then there is the osmotic membrane here. We, we remember from the view in thermodynamics that the osmotic membrane allows you to visualize and to effectively have pressure potential inside <clears throat> your osmometer if you add solutes. So these are actually containing much more solutes because these are cells to a point that is um, that gives you an osmotic potential in the protoplast of minus 1.2 megapascal. Remember, we did the calculation of seawater the, the osmotic potential of seawater and it was 2.7 negative megapascal. So this is that will say less than half of the salts of seawater, but still quite a bit of, of, of solutes inside. <clears throat> and then you can say that this in general is in thermodynamic equilibrium with, with the water inside the xylem. So the protoplast water is in equilibrium with the water that is flowing into the xylem. So the water potential is the same in the xylem in the protoplast, but the plant now can play games by adding or subtracting solutes and changing the actual pressure inside the protoplast to keep, to keep a, a positive pressure potential inside, which means, which allows the cells to remain, remain turgid, even in an, in an atmosphere that typically, in an environment that typically has negative water potential, and where, where everything else that has no solutes would be under quite strong suction. We'll see that later in better in the next slide. These two types of water in the protoplast and in the xylem are in thermodynamic equilibrium approximately. And they're separated by an osmotic membrane. So we know what happens by having reviewed uh, the experiment of the osmometer. This is exactly the same situation. We have the xylem here and the protoplast with more solutes. They're in contact with the osmotic membrane. Uh, at some point, if there is thermodynamic equilibrium, it means that some water has flown this way to to get flow this way to get some enough 
to, to compensate with the differences in, in chemical potential. And the, as a result, we have a pressure here, a positive turgor inside the protoplast. This is what the plant cell needs, positive pressure turgidity to function properly. The same thing happens in our cells. We need salts, we need um, enough negative osmotic potential to, to get enough positive pressure to keep turgidity in our cells. So in, in formulas, this is what happens. The total water potential in the protoplast is equal because of thermodynamic equilibrium to the total water potential in the xylem, but the components are different. Here in the protoplast, this one is pretty negative, which allows us to, to, to have a compensation in pressure and have this positive. Whereas in the xylem, this is almost negligible, it's not, it's not very big. And if this is negative, this will also be negative. So we have typical suction of, inside the xylem. The summary of what happens to these terms here in the protoplast is given by the Hoffler diagrams, diagram that tracks the three components of the water potential in the protoplast as the plant uh, dry. So this is the cell relative water content. Here one is fully saturated, well water plant. And here we have water potential. So we start with well water plant. We have full turgidity. Let's say that we start from a water potential that is only slightly negative. This is the amount of osmotic potential. So this is almost zero, this guy. This is, let's say, is minus 0.2 negative means that this is basically plus point, plus 1.2 almost positive. So it's a good turgor, it's, it's a good pressure to begin with. The plant, the cell functions well. But then as the drought progresses, the total water potential inside the plant goes down and so, do, and so does the osmotic, but not as much pressure because the concentration changes, but not as dramatically. And then it means that the pressure potential also goes down, basically almost follows the total water potential. The turgidity drops, goes down almost to zero. And at, there is a point at which it's so low that it cannot actually push the membranes against the cell wall, and these tend to detach. This is the in, incipient plasmolysis. Which is, which is a big problem for, for the cell that begins basically to die or at least to get uh, uh, permanent damages. The plant can do a so-called osmotic adjustment, can try to, as there is a drought, add even more solutes into the cell. So lower its omega p, its uh, uh, osmotic pressure, with, with the purpose of keeping the turgidity higher. The pressure higher, and this will delay the incipient problems that you had here. So it, they will they will happen, but only later on. So osmotic adjustment is actually a, a good way for plants to fight uh, water stress, to maintain turgor and reduce, for example, the onset of closure of uh, of stomas. This this S star. And we will play with when we will play with that in the model. We will have in mind the plants exactly doing these strategies of increasing the solute content of their protoplast, especially at the leaf level to, or at the root level, to allow for water transport, to allow for functioning, even if the water potential is low. And this is just a summary of different ways in which plants do osmotic adjustment at the leaf level, at the root level, to maintain turgor, and then to be able to still grow, to maintain transpiration, and how these things interact. It's, it's a very int intricate set of uh, plant physiological mechanisms that uh, are related to this osmotic adjustment. But from a point, practical point of view, it, it means that we, we will be adjusting some parameters of our model to take, it, to take into account uh, this, uh, pro this effect. We <clears throat> have pr practically concluded our analysis of the soil plant atmosphere continuum. We have left two big uh, uh, sections not done, not covered, 
the stomatal conductance and the photosynthesis. We'll do that in the next set of nodes. For now, let's just close here with the summary of what we have done. We have gone through the soil plant atmosphere continuum. We have written the transport equation for liquid water through the series of resistances or conductances from the root to the leaves. And this is summarized by the, by the Van der Onert equation. We have described the root resistance linked it to the soil hydraulic conductivity, to root geometry. We have seen that in the xylem we have laminar flow. We can have embolism. All of that is described by empirical functions, these vulnerability curves that decrease their conductivity as the water potential in the plant drops. <clears throat> and then at the leaf, the very interesting biological control on water, energy, and carbon fluxes. The water, liquid water and from the xylem enter into the enters into the mesophyll, evaporates into the stomatal cavities, and then plants can open and close their stomates, controlling this flux to maximize the uptake of CO2, uptake of carbon for their growth, and minimize their water loss. We haven't said anything of how that functions, and therefore we haven't done anything of modeling of this GS, the stomatal conductance, because we will wait uh, until we have described the photosynthesis and how plants function. We have concluded by reminding ourselves of how the water stress progressively becomes worse as soil dry, and how we can describe this by tracking the opening and closing of the stomates, onset of water stress all, all the way to the wilting point when we have complete the stomatal closure, and finally describe uh, mechanisms that plants have to cope with water stress, for example, through the osmotic adjustment, changing the amount of solutes inside, inside their cells and playing with this uh, osmometer type of mechanism that they can have. Finally, a little bit of homework, just section 413 and 442 of the notes give you more to read about um, roots and, and uh, cavitation and other things inside the plant. I would ask you to do problems uh, and note, just read them, what's in the 4.1 through 4.6 at the end of chapter 4. Thank you.